How long Maybe. was um, end to end? I like how, how how long was your stint? Because I saw end to end at Spanky's with uh, Haywire and Carrie Nation, and mm -hmm. um, I I saw that show, and then it seemed like you guys were there. But I don't know. But you were playing in with them at that time. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, I was in I was in um, Addiction slash end to end for about a year. That was about the age. I was not the original guitarist, but. The first guitarist really didn't work out. I think they'd had, uh, they may have had a show or two, um, some rehearsals. Um, but I, I knew John Rowe and I knew um, Eric Egan who was playing bass. And so they recruited me. My, my Fist Heavy Children was just ending. They knew about that. They recruited me. Everything seemed to work out really good. And so that was about a year, the end to end, uh, the addiction end to end to end. And, and I say that because the, the, there was just a name change. There really wasn't a, a band member change or even... Uh, we, you know, we obviously took songs from Addiction into End to End, and then the ones that were a little bit better were we had started to record. And, and then about, well, when you get in, okay, so then, so then from there, you two, you mentioned process. Now, when process forms, it's a three piece, right? Process forms is a three piece. Yeah. We huh? Huh? How about how about this little steel trap of a memory we we got? You did great. Yeah. This oh, World of Fire. Yes. Yes. Oh, and then this, yup, yeah, the, okay, we're going to get to Regeneration, because there was a big sort of a sea change in the vocals when uh, Regeneration comes. We got a song on that, and uh, Dennis, Dennis of Conversion, he was a really great guy, he also yep. put this one for us, so, yeah, um, process, so process was like... How did it form? How, did, how do you meet Egg? Or Eric Egan? How I met Egg, we can call him Egg, um, well, I met Egg in high school. We went to Claremont High together. Okay. And so, you know, he was uh, he was a, a scenester. He was, uh, you know, going to the shows, and he, he and I were good friends, so we would, you know, back and forth to each other's houses and stuff like that. And uh, um, he wanted, uh, naturally, he wanted to be involved with music and things, so uh, the bass was his uh, aspiration. So, And he, he did well at that. He did well at that. And so, um, yeah, so process was like, Process started at the end of end to end. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a rough story, but um, we were recording an end to end full album. The EP that came out was just the songs that had been completed. So we were recording a full album um, for end to end at Spot Recording, which was a really great place in Orange County. There was a lot of bands who did uh, stuff with, uh, with Dave Corey over at Spot. So Spot was great. And... Um, I guess some songs that we had on a, on a scratch tape off of the soundboard got forwarded over to um, Purcelli and the Schism guys, and they got excited about it. And that's cool. It was a good. It was a good recording. And uh, we were invited for a tour. And um, who was that tour with? It was a Judge tour. We were invited for. It was going to be like maybe I think it was like going to be a six or seven gig tour on the East Coast. But um, myself. And uh, Egg and uh, uh, Brian Boss, really great drummer, Brian Boss. Um, it, it just didn't make sense for us, and so we we opted out. But this this frustrated Raw, and so he quit. And at that stage, we you know we still wanted to play together and stuff, and we just thought it was best to move forward. So process was basically three of the four members moving on to continue to play music and have a good time. Gotcha, gotcha. So then you guys do that first record. You guys recorded that first record at South Coast Studios, as yeah. I as I as I recall. Can can you talk at all about? Because one thing I always loved was the guitar sound on that record, very very clean. Which, mm -hmm. if I remember, there was a story about how you got that amp, and it, I'm assuming it's the same amp, but it may not have been. Like, it was in recycler or something, but the person that was selling it didn't know how much it was worth, and then they kind of figured it out by the time you showed up, and you were like, hey, we <laughs> we have a deal. Was I close? Yeah, you're close on that. You're referring to my SG, my Gibson SG, a 1980 Gibson SG. Okay. I didn't have any equipment when I was in Pillsbury, and I didn't know how to go about getting it or what was good prices or anything like that. I'd been borrowing equipment for a really long time. And uh, Eric Wood just looked inside, I think it was a recycler, either that or the LA Times Gibson SG 1980s for sale, 170 bucks. And so we, it was a Saturday morning, I remember it very vividly, and we just flew down there as fast as we could possibly drive. 
this is before cell phones and all this sort of thing. And we just had a basic commitment with, with this uh, nice young gal to pick it up. And we drove over to her apartment, gave her 170 cash and drove home. And by the time I got home, my mom's like, dude, this gal, is just, she's like calling like every 10 minutes. So I'm like, okay, whatever. I'll call her back. I'm like, what's up? She's like, you ripped me off, you know, whatever. Just so mad. I'm like, what? And she's like, <laughs> I talked to some guy and he said that guitar's worth all this time. I don't know. I mean, I'm just a kid. I mean, I'm like 14, 15 years old, but yeah, that, that was a really great sounding guitar. This is exactly the same guitar that Al of SSD recorded um, most of his uh, historically better records. Um, <laughs> Dang, don't say that. Don't say that. What? You, you, you like, you like uh, Break It Up? Well, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying like, like, you know, you say historically better. I mean, you're, you're, oh no, I thought you were referring to your records. No, 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 I was referring to Al. Oh, okay, uh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> he, he moved, he, he broke that, he broke that guitar. He jumped on stage and broke that guitar, so he went to a BC Rich <laughs> Warlock, which is whatever. Right. Um, uh, no, it was a really great guitar, and um, it had a good sound, but I, I loaded it with a, an active pickup, an EMG, and so matched with a 100-watt Marshall, and I had a, um, Ted from Justice League had uh, wired up a, a generic cab with uh, Celestians for me, and it was it, it was a really good it was a really good sound. I really like that sound. Originally, I had a 50 watt Tweed, a green Tweed 50 watt Marshall, and you had to really you had to almost go up to five or six to get like some good volume out of that, and it really um, it really changed the shape of it. But the end to end record uh, does have a really great guitar on it too, and I do like the process one as well. It's a 100 watt Marshall. Uh, with a matching cab and that SG, and I think, I think I had a Yamaha processor with a little bit of chorus, just, just a smidge to just sort of open up the sound a little bit. But by the time we were playing like at Spanky's and and I had two matching half stacks on either side of the stage, that was stereo with that same processor, and it was really really loud. In fact, I remember we played um, a show there with uh, Chain of Strength. And Ryan Hoffman was up front, and I turned that thing on, and he was like, "Oh, dude, it's too loud! Stop! Oh man, you're like you're bleeding. Go get some earplugs. I don't know what to tell you, man. I'm not gonna change it. But it was great. It was great. I really love that sound. I've had a lot of people say that they they really love the sound of the end of NDP. It, it it was good. I mean, we we were so we were so competent in what we were doing at that stage, uh, which is a shame why we didn't finish an LP. But I mean, that record was done in one take. Oh, wow. 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 Okay. wow. Uh, no, there's no question about it. I mean, and I don't even, I don't even think I did two guitar tracks. I think that's one track. So when you, so then, you, so then you go from end to end, you're doing process. You went in right to do another 12 inch though, right? Like, cause the steel, cause correct me, I, I've always thought steel jaws was part of that recording. The steel jaws seven inch or no. It is. And I don't remember, I, I think Dennis and Conversion had financial um, issues. I mean, I think he wanted to do a lot of things with us, but there just wasn't a lot of finances. So there was a lot of delay in the pressing. I think the seven inch was his way of saying to us, you know, I want to keep process moving forward, but I don't have the finances to back a 12 inch. Probably back then, uh, an EP was probably a third of the cost of doing an LP. Right. But those, that's different now. Now it's like yeah, they're almost this, it's almost the same money to do a seven inches of twelve these days. But um, yeah, I think he just was really wanting to support us and get something out on the on the in the market, if you will. You know, which was really like you know, if I was going to give any band any advice, uh, if I was asked about it, I would say. You got to get a recording done. You got to get it out as soon as possible so people can know what you're about. Bands that have sort of, so many good bands never got into the recording studio and got anything put out. Not that everything should be on vinyl necessarily, but just didn't get something out. And so nobody knew what they're about. You know, people want to sing along with the songs, right? People want to go there with anticipation about what they're going to hear. And if they don't know, you know, there's, there's something really missing about that. 